If you had a time machine, where would you go? Or if you could be a star, which one would you be? These are the idle questions we sometimes ask ourselves, but I think being a modern star is really quite common. After all, anyone could become one these days. I want to be a real star. Someone whose light shines on for hundreds of years. Someone whose life and work encapsulates all the glamour of the human condition from the gutter to the gods. He must be scandalous and tragic. He must be brilliant and tortured. Above all, my heart must stop beating when he comes into the room. Who else? But Lord Byron. Byron was the first modern sex symbol. This sensual adventurer travelled from his ancestral home on a voyage where his life and art became one, igniting unprecedented fame and infamy. I want to discover how the extreme experiences of his journey turned an obscure poet into a best-selling phenomenon and the original anti-hero. On his exotic adventures, Byron travelled with an entourage and 17 cabin trucks. I'm travelling light, following him across Europe to the Orient via Portuguese hookers, Albanian bandit country and Italian royalty. Seeking out Byron's marbled halls of sodomy and sherbet, abusing embassy hospitality and, like him, ending up at the VD Club. Byron was Britain's most successful poet and really her first international celebrity. With the vanity and the sexual appetites of a modern rock star, even those who adored him were forced to admit that he was mad, bad, and dangerous to know. In the summer of 1809, Lord Byron set sail on an extraordinary boy's own adventure. Accompanied by four servants and a friend from Cambridge, the 22-year-old was hungry for excitement and exoticism. Byron was funding the entire two-year expedition, mostly with borrowed money. But that didn't stop him from commissioning this flamboyant portrait of himself to commemorate his departure. This was no ordinary grand tour. Europe was in the grip of the Napoleonic Wars and few dared travel. But Byron wanted to go to the edge to discover himself while tasting every danger and delight. Unable to disembark in war-torn France, Byron landed in the louche southern city of Lisbon, famed for its bars and bordellos. Well, one can only imagine this whole group of English people, a very eccentric group, a kind of swishy aristocrat with his village family retainers, all trying to get the baggage together, all kind of raising their eyebrows at Milord, kind of, you know, flouncing around. It must have been very festive and really fun. Oh. Byron was no innocent abroad. He'd already lost his virginity to his nanny at the age of nine and greedily experimented with actresses, servant girls, multiple prostitutes, and even a 17-year-old choir boy. He was now ready to taste the forbidden fruits of other lands. You wait and see. Byron and his Cambridge friend, John Hobhouse, hit the stews of Lisbon, and Byron immediately fell for the charms of Hispanic women. As he wrote, they are formed for all the witching arts of love, Perhaps I should sample those witching arts for myself. Some things never change. Oh. Hi. Elena, how are you? Hi. Elena is a high-class call girl, Hi. and she's met a fair few Englishmen coming here in Byron's footsteps yeah, to experience sure. the most intimate kind of Latin hospitality. Thank you. Byron said um, about Spanish women that they were very well formed in the witching arts of love. Mm -hmm. and. Um, I suppose they were much more sophisticated and earthy than English girls, probably. Yeah, I do, I do think so, because we have an uh, open mind in right. bed. Yes. And we allow the men do what else they want. Right. If it's good for us, of course. Right. You know? Yeah. Have you had um, much experience with English guys? Yeah. 
You have? Yeah. Oh. Um, Lots of experience. Really? Yeah. And what are English guys like in bed? But Just, compared to, for example, Germans? Oh, yeah. English men are more careful. Quicker? Yes. No. They are very kind with me. Really? Yeah. We have a reputation for not being... Maybe we got... I think we got better recently, actually. Yeah. Um, but we used to have a reputation of being people who kind of had a grope in the back of a taxi and yeah. also premature ejaculation. Yeah. But not not in, not in, with me. Not in your experience. <laughs> no. Well that's very good. Who yeah. who has the biggest penises? <laughs> I don't know. I think Brazilian ones. Brazilians yeah. always have good ones. Yeah. High five. <laughs> <laughs> Byron picked his way through the streets of Lisbon, avoiding soldiers and the odd cuckolded husband. This impressive brooding figure, blessed with a member by some accounts of Brazilian proportion, could have almost any woman he pleased. Yet he hid from them the deformed leg he'd had since birth. This British lord abroad was most definitely not all he seemed. Posh, penniless, his father had effectively deserted him and his stocky, neurotic mother, leaving them with a crumbling estate and mounting debts. He was a mass of contradictions, with his nose in the gutter and his head in the stars. Byron's sights were set much further east. After Spain and Malta, where he had affairs with married women and collected locks of their hair, he headed to the wildest country in the Western world. It was a blank space on the map that few Englishmen had ever visited. Byron called it Terra Incognita. Its real name, Albania. This violent and forbidding land was to have a remarkable effect on Byron. It would inspire the poem that would change his life. Here, finally in Albania, Byron was lost to his own world. And so am I. This is one of the last unknown spots in Europe and I'm planning to live dangerously. The church bells of Cambridge must never have seemed further away. The two friends must have had their hearts in their mouths as they climbed these treacherous hills. No nation are so detested, said Byron, and dreaded by their neighbors and the Albanese. Their habits are predatory, all are armed. Albania was ruled by the most bloodthirsty despot in Europe, the ferocious Ali Pasha, not known for his kindness to strangers. Byron was determined to meet him, not least because of Ali Pasha's spirited resistance to his Ottoman overlords. The two boys embarked on a hazardous journey into the heart of bandit country. Remarkably, the brutal warlord sent soldiers to escort them. Byron was thrilled. Sadly, I've just got my guide and Byron expert, Auron, and a couple of donkey bashers. More or less 200 years ago today, Byron was coming down this actual road. One of the things Byron liked here was um, the very bonded male society. I think he very much appreciated that and actually even wrote about, rather nastily, about the women, saying that since the weather was so nice, it was quite uh, a good job that they were out building the roads and laboring. <laughs> and I guess he was asserting himself in a way as a man as well, because remember he had a crippled foot and he was kind of effeminate in a way. And I think those guys kind of embraced him in a way. Yeah. They didn't judge him, who he was, or anything like that. It just kind of, you know, was part of them. As Byron traveled to Pasha's castle, surrounded by his band of soldiers, something clicked. He was at the center of an extraordinary unfolding story. Much of the detail of his journey so far was too scandalous for diary form so he semi-fictionalized it in the most celebrated travel blog in the history of the English language, as a poem about a boy called, not Byron, but Harold. He left the primal city of the land and onwards did his further journey take to greet Albania's chief, whose dread command is lawless law, for with a bloody hand he sways a nation, turbulent and bold. Da -da! <laughs> what do you think? It's good stuff. Matching Byron's lust for life was his power to describe it in every lurid detail. Child Harold's pilgrimage would enthrall everyone who could read in Regency England, 
and make him as famous as the prince. Byron reinvented himself as that very modern kind of celebrity, someone whose art and life are one. He didn't travel just to see, but to be seen. He had himself painted in this splendid Albanian costume. Two centuries on, and I'm expected to model a distinctly tacky copy. I'll put this on first. Yes. This feels pretty sissy. Putting it on made me wonder, where did the real Byron end and the poser begin? Like the smartest of stars, he was too playful, too ironic to ever let you know. No one could have chosen a more stupid headdress if they tried. I feel like my mother going out to a village hall meeting of the village council. She loves red and gold and a nice white skirt. Byron, I don't really feel like. I feel like a whirling dervish, no. And this is what it was meant to look like. The thing that's interesting, I think, about Byron here is how self-aware he was, how aware he was of building his own image up, rather like David Bowie's Ziggy Stardust or something, this child Harold uh, who was going to be painted, etched, uh, he was going to appear in lithographs, and uh, this young boy, incredibly arrogant at this point, uh, very uh, into himself, he knew exactly, in terms of career, where he was going to go, I think, and that's quite extraordinary. So. I'd love to get out of this costume ASAP. It makes you feel a bit of a twat sometimes. I mean, I feel like a twat most of the time anyway, but... Byron's flamboyant nature was about to meet its match. The warlord Ali Pasha's taste for pretty young men was well known. When he did finally meet the young English lord, he liked what he saw. As Byron wrote to his mother, Pasha remarked on, my small ears, curling hair, and little white hands, and expressed himself pleased with my appearance and garb. He sent me almonds and sugared sherbet 20 times a day, even asking for me at night when he was more at leisure. Byron was more than just flattered by the warlord's advances. He might have enjoyed sleeping with women, but I don't think he was particularly interested in them. He even claimed they didn't have souls. So the sheer power behind Ali Pasha's embrace must have made his hair stand up on end, if nothing else. What was um, Ali Pasha's uh, position uh, with women? Everyone says he was a screaming old queen, basically. Yeah, he's, a, he's, a, he's an interesting character. What do they think in Albania if, if I was to say on national television that he had an affair with Byron, for example? Would I be, <laughs> <laughs> would I be put into the pillory? Uh, not at all. I mean, <laughs> I, I think it did. Oh, really? Tell me. Uh, well, from what little we know, I mean, uh, there are some kind of uh, hints that uh, they might have something. When Byron finally reached Ali Pasha's fabulous castle, he found a wealth of dramatic material for his alter ego that would shock and thrill his audience. Now, this is the one of the, the entrance to the castle. Uh, right. But uh, obviously, this is not what oh, the castle. Was. It used to look, I mean, there is a great description of Byron when he walk in with the imam praying and the drums the beating, the drums beating, the horses Eunuchs, around. Greeks, yep. Nubians. It's a, it's a great description that he Tartars. gave. Tartars. In daring to make this pilgrimage, Byron wasn't only collecting raw data for his epic travelogue, Child Harold, but setting the tone for the rest of his life. Impetuous, reckless, amoral, he lived for the moment. And this is the, the gate I believe they walked in. Oh, a lot of rubbish. It's very sad the way it is, but this is the entrance where they came. And you can see the view. You can see for miles here. And you can, you can just hear the cattle bells. Oh yeah, easy. So you could hear people coming probably from miles off up here. This castle feels like it's, it really is kind of Hollywood does um, the Orient. Well, you always see it endlessly in Hollywood, huge painted castles on the tops of rocks and English travelers kind of going up with a mule up the hill, knocking on the boom, boom, boom door and opening and you see this kind of orgy of Nubian slaves and eunuchs and Greek soldiers and Tartars, all the things that are in here and drums going boom, 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 boom. And um, it really is like that in a way. 
And this mad, huge mammoth bisexual man with long fingers covered in jewels, fingering our poor Lord Byron. It's all very exciting. Lord Byron was soon to become the first real celebrity. And it was in Albania that the mutual adoration needed between a star and his audience first blossomed. Word is out that I'm doing a film about it, so I've been invited onto Albania's biggest talk show. Byron championed Albania in his poetry, and remarkably, he's still a national hero here. I've got to be on this Albanian chat show for two whole hours. I'm spreading even me a little bit thin. I'm going to kill my bloody director when I get my hands on him. However, like Byron, I'm going to put my best withered foot forward. The strange thing is, in, in Albania, people seem to know Byron uh, much better than they do in England. But it was really actually only coming here, in a way, to Albania, where I started to discover um, really what Byron meant um, in the 19th century to, to the rest of the world. Byron was a flirt and a gossip. He detested mealy-mouthed diplomacy, an attitude that I've learned can have a price. Madonna, ne kemi dhe fotografin që mund të shfaqim ndërkohë në ekran dhe në një moment në libër thoni që djersin sex appeal. She sweats sex appeal. No, I said she sweats. She sweats. Jo, kanë thënë si është që djersin, jo djersin sex appeal. Byron made the Albanian warlord Ali Pasha famous in the West for his flattering portrayal of his brutal yet noble revolution and his fight for Albanian independence. And the Albanians returned the favour. Byron is immortalised across the land. What it says is the famous quote about savage nurse to a rugged man. No, rugged nurse to a savage man. Hi. Can, the, can one of these children please read this to me? The Albanians, cut off from the West for decades, have an extraordinary appetite for poetry. Everyone seems to have heard of Byron. Burash. What does that mean then? Albania, let me bend my eyes on thee, you rugged nurse of savage man. All right. What is this place called? Oh, this is Sheshi. Oh, square is Sheshi. Yes. Sheshi Lord, Sheshi Lord Baron. Okay. And where is the Socialist Communist Party headquarters? <laughs> where? Yeah. Yeah. Because I want to start a revolution and become communist in Albania again. What do you think? Maybe Yeah. Yeah. No. 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 Oh, okay. Well, I won't then. <laughs> Cheers. 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 Lord Byron had found himself in Albania. His passion and pansexuality, that had been so at odds with Regency England, had been fired here. Surrounded by the 50 soldiers that Ali Pasha had assigned to him, the English lord and his poetic alter ego were in their element. But as the flames along their faces gleamed, their gestures nimble, dark eyes flashing free, the long wild locks that to their girdles streamed, while thus in concert they half sang, half screamed. As Byron prepared to continue his journey, he was empowered and emboldened. <laughs> Doors kept opening with new possibilities, and all these new possibilities were absolutely like stars coming into line. Uh, he'd felt this sexual ambiguity in himself. He'd realized it wasn't accepted uh, in the milieu that he came from, in the country that he came from. And on his travels, he suddenly discovered that uh, all the things he was feeling, other people were feeling, not only other people, but the most powerful people around, uh, the butcher's warlord actually was fancying him. I think it gave him this life's destiny of pushing and pushing and pushing. And Tennessee Williams, uh, when he writes about Lord Byron, in, in the kind of acid trip play, uh, Camino Real. Baron's last line as he leaves Camino Real is, make journeys, attempt them, there's nothing else. 
Constantinople, spanning the Bosphorus, center of the Ottoman Empire. Arriving here, Byron wrote in Child Harold. More oft I've seen such sight and heard such song as wooed the eye and thrilled the Bosphorus above. But he was always irreverent. He said the difference between the British or the English and the Turkish were that the vices in fashion in England were whoring and drinking, whereas in Turkey they were sodomy and sherbet. So I'm rather looking forward to a bit of sodomy and sherbet myself while I'm here. <laughs> sorry, Granny, sorry, Mum. <laughs> Byron had avoided the predictability of standard grand tour destinations in favor of the more exotic. He discovered the imaginative possibilities of Turkey by going well off the beaten track. I think this must be some kind of um, catalog of what, first of all, is available in the Constantinople. Byron and Hophouse went to these kind of bars slash pubs where boy dancers did beastly things according to Hobhouse's, Hobhouse's descriptions. And he called them um, buggery shops. And uh, they did kind of basic lap dances for guys. And then uh, guys would take them off and um, have sex with them. Here's one with the kind of Liberty at the Barricades hat. Or Father Chris, Ooh. And a tattoo. I don't know whether he's been waxing, but he's got a little kind of bit of hair down the middle only. And one ball. Seems to be Turkish tradition. For this beastly sight, we paid 55 piastres, Ooh. five to the boys each, and five to all the fiddlers. Half mast. Byron excitedly described the hammams as a marble paradise of sherbet and sodomy. Oh, prisoner. Naked prisoner with a hard on. You see, you can have fun in prison even in Ottoman Turkey. <laughs> <laughs> this is um, stories about various bathhouse boys. <laughs> and they really are quite extraordinary. Here's a good one. Hamleki Ibrahim was once a young soldier of the Sultan's bodyguard division. He lies uncovered in bed or on the white marble floor of the halberd. He never cares if the penis is too long or too big, but takes it in with the power of his youth without any complaint. He goes on all night until the sun rises without charge and becomes your fellow lover in bed. This much loyalty is more than you would expect from a naked bath masser. <laughs> His nightly cost was 450 silver coins. To get the utmost enjoyment out of these nightly visits, he never hesitates to lie under his host and to entertain him with his arsehole. <laughs> He's a passionate and valorous man. I mean it. <laughs> so there you go. It wasn't just the sex lives of the Ottoman Empire that fascinated Byron, but its power and politics. Britannia. He looked on Turkey's sultan as the ruler of a vast, oppressive empire. But that didn't stop him from using his title to gain an introduction. Like him, I've wangled an invitation to stay at the British Embassy. I sometimes thought I should have been an ambassador. I could have been an ambassador. I'd have been very good, very regal, or vice-regal at least. <laughs> Good afternoon. This building is on the same site as the embassy that Byron visited in 1810. It's now the Consulate General. And our man in Istanbul is called Jessica. And she's rather wonderful. Thank you very much for, uh, having me. Let's go up the oh, grand staircase. Oh, God, this is quite grand. Oh, it's, it is a nice bit of furniture. You like that. I thought you'd like that. So we have our visitor's book. Would you oh, sign sure, it, sure, please? Sign it, yes. Now then. I have a feeling somebody's watching me. It's Her Majesty, in very good shape. Fine-looking woman. She does look marvellous, but she's quite well hung, isn't she? I mean... <laughs> not well... What do you say? Stacked. <laughs> good for her. Thank you, Your Majesty, for having me. <laughs> That's why you'll never make it into the diplomatic service. No, because if I'd gone into the diplomatic, I wouldn't be like this <laughs> now. <laughs> right, this is our room. And then we've got two guest rooms up here. One, on, one that doesn't have a bathroom, one that does have a bathroom that is yours. Good. OK, see you all later. Bye. Thanks a lot. OK. <laughs> Cup of tea, please, someone. <laughs> <laughs> 
and a couple of belly dancers. <laughs> oh, Jessica, you are naughty. You haven't had the window cleaners in before the party. <laughs> Byron behaved rather bizarrely in Turkey, dressing up in strange costumes and generally ruffling local British feathers with his extreme mood swings. He found the Turks honest, but was appalled by their brutality and the sight of human heads on stakes. However, the timing of his visit couldn't have been better. The ambassador was about to have his farewell audience with the fearsome sultan, and Byron got himself invited along. Byron arrived in full kind of military regalia, not that he was ever in a regiment, Superb. with epaulettes and an extraordinary hat with feathers, only to discover the protocol in Turkey meant that even though he was uh, a lord, he had to go behind yes. this man called Canning, who was uh, um, an ordinary person, and he had the most amazing hissy fit and stormed off. Anyway, he was obsessed by his position at this point. Okay. So did he ever, uh, ever actually stay in the house, or I did he, he just stayed, visit? he uh, stayed for two or three nights at okay. first. Excellent. So you really are treading in the footsteps? Absolutely. Excellent. Yeah. But you're not going to do the bizarre uniform and... Not tonight, no. Please. <laughs> Versace all the way for me. Excellent. <laughs> I think I'm going to have a bubble bath now. <laughs> I've always longed to do a striptease at an embassy. <laughs> da -da 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 -da. <laughs> 200 years ago, more or less now, Byron would have been spending his first night in the embassy. I wonder what he was thinking about it all. He was such a conflicted character at this stage, it's hard to follow all the mood swings he goes through, from ecstasy to irritation. Again, Byron's charm and his rudeness are fascinating. You know, irresistibly charming and incredibly rude. Uh, so enemies and incredibly loyal friends only, nothing in the middle. Um, just the way we like it, really. In Byron's day, the diplomatic issues were burning hot and he was fascinated by them. Tonight, the biggies are all here. I think I'll see what I can do to help. When Margaret Thatcher came here a few years back, uh, she did something very funny. She quoted Lord Byron, saying, there is no difference between the Turks and um, the English. And then some uh, journalist looked up in Byron to see what the end of the quote was. And the quote actually was, <laughs> the fashions and vices are that the English love whoring and uh, drinking, and the Turks love sodomy and sherbet. <laughs> <laughs> so she put her foot in yeah, there. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean... They don't like that anymore, it seems. No. Uh, of course, he was quite enlightening in, in a way about um, Ottoman sexuality as well. But he said that um, the only difference between the English and the Turks are the English uh, like whoring and drinking, and the Turks like sherbet and sodomy. <laughs> wow. Is this something that he said? Yes. <laughs> so it's, you know, quite amusing. I'm not sure that Byron was quite as inept as a diplomat, but he did eventually get to meet the Sultan. The event made little impression on him. Still, he saw straight through the Western cliché of the Turk as a base, unthinking heathen and was impressed by Islamic science, education and apparent honesty. But in the end, there was little here to fire his spirits and within four days of meeting the Sultan, he moved on. The Hellespont, the entrance from the Mediterranean to the Black Sea, and the junction of Europe with Asia certainly did fire Byron's imagination. Maybe because he had a withered leg, he kept wanting to prove himself physically, fencing, boxing, and above all, swimming. Here he staged one of his most memorable feats, swimming from one continent to the other. I've been forced against my will to swim this Hellespont later on today. So, um, yeah, I am a bit worried about being run over by a cargo ship or drowning in the wake. But it's better than dying during a facelift, I suppose. <laughs> Byron had a deep need to 
prove his manly prowess. And he wrote that the feat of swimming between Asia and Europe here at the Hellespont meant more to him than any kind of glory. It's a lot longer and more hazardous than it looks, so I'm getting some local help. As you can see from the arrows, that, that's our point of uh, travel. It's two miles. Why can't we go quicker in that bit? There's uh, boat traffic there. in Kansas. Kansas. We're going to perform a swimming from north to south. Wow, it's a long way. And these are the two boys who are going to be swimming with me? What's your name? Dennis. 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 And what's your name? Dennis Martin. Rupert. Ben Rupert. Hope you don't have to uh, stop me from drowning. <laughs> <laughs> Byron swam the Hellespont following in the wake of the mythological figure Leander, who did the same to demonstrate his romantic love of the priestess Hero. Byron was very consciously echoing classical romance. He also loved the sea for its own sake, saying, I delight in it and come out with a buoyancy of spirits I never feel on any other occasion. My hopes of being liberated by the same experience were cruelly dashed. Forced to stop for each Russian tanker that crossed our path, we made it more than halfway across before we finally had to give up. Byron was very courageous in one sense. He'd somehow decided to be a cripple and to be sexy. Uh, and, you know, that takes a lot of courage and spunk, uh, for want of a better word. Byron wrote this after um, crossing the Hellespont. For me, degenerate modern wretch, Though in the genial month of May, my dripping limbs I faintly stretch and think I've done a feat today. Sweet. Degenerate modern wretch. Was that Byron's view of himself? Two days after swimming the Hellespont, he wrote to a friend, I'm tolerably sick of vice which I have tried in its agreeable varieties, and mean on my return to cut all dissolute acquaintance, leave off wine and carnal company, and betake myself to politics and decorum. Right. In Turkey, he had seen another bloated empire hell-bent on dominating and suppressing any weak nation within its reach. Byron always loved an underdog, none more passionately than the Ottoman-occupied country he was now heading for, his beloved Greece. Of course, the most exciting thing about a journey is the idea one has of its destination. Even if you never arrive at the destination, even if the destination, as in Byron's case, almost inevitably pisses you off. But here, the idea of arriving in Athens, the center of ancient Greece, must have been like stepping into a, an acid trip. The ancient Greece that Byron knew and admired from school and whose literature influenced his poetry was in ruins, and his countrymen were scavenging the remains. He picked a very public fight with Lord Elgin for carrying off large chunks of antiquity back to England. But the larger damage he saw here set him on a crusade that would shape the rest of his life. Byron made a connection between these ruins and what he saw uh, as this incredible Greek submissiveness to hundreds of years of Ottoman rule. Well, the Greek people were ruined, and so he connected the two of them. And um, again, this for him was a seed that was going to grow and grow and grow over the next years. I think everything came into focus for Byron in this first 10-week trip to Athens. He thought, he suddenly saw that poetry can in fact be the bellows of revolution. It can fan the flames, and he saw it as another potential way that he could express himself because he was becoming more and more of an outsider every step he made. And of course, Child Harold, Byron's idealized version of himself, took up the cause. Fair Greece, sad relic of departed worth, immortal though no more, though fallen great. Who now shall lead thy scattered children forth 
and long accustomed bondage uncreate. This was um, a verse, uh, a copy of which, well, the original, I think, is in some university in America. And in answer to all these questions, who now shall lead thy scattered children forth, Byron wrote Byron. Uh, and long accustomed bondage uncreate. And then he wrote underneath that Byron. <laughs> uh, so already he was seeing himself, as usual, center stage, leading Greece into the promised land. Byron fell for all things Greek. Their sensibilities chimed with his, and when he and Hobhouse found themselves watching an erotic puppet show in an Athens cafe, Hobhouse professed loftily nothing could be more beastly, but I'm sure Byron loved it. Byron's sexual appetites were omnivorous. One of his worst poems, The Maid of Athens, is said to be inspired by his love for a 13-year-old girl. But actually, his interest in Athenian youth seemed to lie with a boy. Niccolò Giraud, a beautiful 17-year-old, became language tutor and traveling companion to Byron. They stayed together in this monastery. And on a trip with Niccolò, they passed through here, and in a letter to Hophouse, he said, he achieved at least 200 times, coitum plenum et optabilem, with Niccolò Giraud. This phrase, plen et optabil dash coit, was the code word or the code phrase among this group of Cambridge aesthetes, these poofs really, this little puffy posse, uh, Methodists they call each other, or citoyenne. And um, it was their code word. It was dangerous to write about these things in those days. It was, uh, you know, terrible things happened in England. Uh, you can read about um, people who discovered having sex with other men, being put in the pillory. They often died in the pillory. Uh, the crowds of thousands came to hurl things at them. Shit, dead cats, everything. It was a very, very dangerous game in England to be a poof. So they had to be very careful how they wrote about it. There can be no doubt that he not only had sex with Niccolo, but also that, insofar as Byron ever did, he fell in love with him. And in his original will, he left him 7,000 pounds, an enormous amount of money then, by any standards. Well, I can't think of a nicer place for full intercourse <laughs> to take place, really. It must have been lovely. It's difficult to work out the real Byron at this stage. The revolutionary hero in waiting, the lover of men and women, the poet creating a whole new world with himself at its center, the public figure or the private man. One thing is for certain, he was one of the earliest practitioners of modern PR. Well, this is an example of the earliest studio publicity still, <laughs> I think. It's, having seen it in photographs, it's lovely to see it up close and personal. This is the Albanian outfit that I myself have worn the felt version of. A lot of people who painted him noted that while he was talking, he was one character, and then he'd put on this kind of moody, petulant face, which he thought was his public face, and people would say to him, why can't you just be natural? And uh, he'd say, this is natural. We actors do this all the time as well. So it, he really is such, a, such an actor, I think. Like beautiful lips. But he knew exactly what he was doing, and um, in one sense, in another sense, this image is the image that's remained with us right until now. And, and certainly in terms of, I think, uh, his English reputation, the English has never managed really to go any further than this image and the idea that he put forward of himself in Child Harold. And actually, it's very clever. 
But in a way, if he was interested in posterity, he's been hoisted by his own petard slightly. Do you like him? Oh, I adore him, yeah. He's hysterical. I mean, he's, you know, he's a really funny old thing. He's mad. Byron was all charm when he wanted to be, and utterly vile um, at um, other points. Remind you of anyone you know? <laughs> <laughs> After two years abroad, Byron headed home with a time bomb, the manuscript of Child Harold. This epic travelogue, suffused with sex, adventure, and danger, would have a bigger impact on English readers than any poem that had ever been published. Facing him on the horizon was fame, fame that he wouldn't have imagined happening because it was just bigger than. I think anyone's fame had been up to that point. It was a, it was a major international stardom, one of the first. Um, and scandal. Scandal. It was going to overwhelm him. After two years of travel, in 1811, Byron returned to London. He went straight to his publisher, John Murray, in Mayfair, to deliver the manuscript of his semi-autobiographical poem, Child Harold's Pilgrimage. At 24, his life was about to be transformed. Come up, anyhow. There's the old boy on his plinth. John Murray's uh, direct descendant, his John Murray the Seventh, yeah, yeah. still runs the place. Um, Yehudi Menuhin's wife came and with very red lipstick kissed him and I wanted the lovely lips to remain on him but my father insisted that it was taken off. But we've had lots of ladies who come and kiss him. Anyhow, this is the... Uh, where Byron and Murray and Walter Scott and everybody met in this room and the portrait by Phillips went up while Byron was still alive right. and uh, people come from all over the world to see it. What Byron had brought back with him was to turn John Murray's establishment into the hottest literary salon in London. It was said that when Child Harold was published Byron woke up to find himself famous, and Murray to find himself a gentleman. Yeah, anyway, but how successful was it? Oh, tremendously successful. The 500 uh, original printing were sold out in three days, and then the sales just skyrocketed. England had been faced by the Napoleonic Wars. Uh, the Battle of Waterloo was still three years ahead. People hadn't travelled very much. Here was someone who came back with these extraordinary stories of the East and the stories of conquests. Yes, now what, what, what do you think happened to Byron after um, the publication of Child Harold? Everybody wanted him, all society were inviting him, all the girls were after him, you know, it must have been an absolutely appalling period. If, but of course he enjoyed it to begin with and he lived it up. Uh, he, whenever he went to Drury Lane, everybody would say that's Byron. Practically everybody had read the book, because they could in those days. You know, the, it, the society wasn't that large, and uh, the women just were like moths to a light. Mm. I mean, I have to say, there's a wonderful letter that he writes to my ancestor, which says um, that last night I had Angelina, the daughter of my physician, and a married woman. Now, he loved explaining that people were married who he was having it off with, you know. And so he grew into this image that they got, I think, from Child Harold. Now, do you have a bit of oh. uh, the Child well, Harold? Well, I'll, I'll show you an I've interesting thing, hands. yes. Here's the, um, the first two cantos, the manuscript of Child Harold. And if we look here, you'll see what's very interesting is that in the first canto, you see it says Child Baron, oh, Baron. Biron. Biron. And he crosses out Biron and he puts Harold which is the evidence that uh, obviously it is fairly autobiographical. And that's really why he caught the imagination. They saw some of the things that happened in here, they see as him as being the person. And therefore he was very naughty, he was wicked, and people love mm -hmm. wicked people. And what about, do you have any of the hair collection? Oh, of I young must. Ladies, pubic well, hair? We haven't got, no, the pubic hair evidently was burnt by one of my ancestors, but I'm not sure. We had a gathering here of the Murray staff once, and uh, not so long ago, and we put out the hair, and I said, now, here's Byron's girlfriend's pubic hair, and one of the girls came forward and said, nonsense, pubic hair's much coarser. <laughs> well, I don't know about that, but, but anyhow... Not uh, if you're Japanese. But I'll show you. <laughs> but now, wait. It's like a curtain. Here is one of my, the most moving bits, which was mounted because it was an exhibition. Hair of Donna Josepha, Spanish lady. This always amazes people that you're allowed to do this, but this is... 
<laughs> now, what do you say to that? But the trouble was that Byron actually fell in love with her sister. Mm. And I, th I think that when she discovered this, she cut off her hair, and this was it, this wonderful lock, and sent it to Byron and went into a nunnery. She must have been quite unbalanced, because they only m could have met for two or three days. Well, they were. They were all very unbalanced when Byron was around. Right. So now, Byron was famous. Everyone wanted a piece. The invitations piled up. And Byron chose tonight's lucky hostess, and with his famous underlook, prepared to make the Jane Austen posh totties swoon, and all the Mr. Darcy's wet with jealousy. An inconsequential and crippled country squire without funds had made it right into the very heart of the empire. And for a brief moment, London society and Byron enjoyed a kind of dangerous honeymoon. This was a new kind of fun. Byron was mobbed everywhere he went. And the society ladies rushed to give him patronage, and in one case, it was rumored that he repaid them by trying to sleep with her 30 year old daughter. When a torrid affair with Lady Caroline Lamb, the first real groupie, began to cool, she turned into a crazed stalker. Byron never chased women, they chased him. Now they besieged him, and he even pleaded with his publisher to protect him from their advances. The modern celebrity culture was born. Fame blinded Byron, but unfortunately he was not above the law. Insanity, alcoholism, and maybe even a spot of sodomy were perfectly acceptable on their own. But add incest to the menu, and society slammed the door. In the next stage of my journey, I'm going to find a man transformed, diving to the depths of pussy-hungry depravity, soaring to the heights of national heroism for a tragic, climactic end. I'll be following Byron into exile for sex, drugs, and revolution. <laughs>